Thank you, Matt Sparling. Thank you, Craig, and our worship team. It has been a great morning already. And if you're new, welcome to Fort Caroline. I am Ricky Powell. I'm the lead pastor here, and it's just a joy to serve this great congregation. And it's a joy to have you with us today. You're, you're joining us in the middle of a series called Broken. And we're preparing our hearts for Easter by looking at what Christ did for us on the cross of Calvary. And uh, today I'm going to take you to the Old Testament book of Isaiah, chapter 53. You may want to take a moment to go ahead and find that, Isaiah chapter 53 in your Old Testament. I'll also put the words on the screen in just a moment. But uh, we're going to be talking today about how Christ is our suffering substitute. I don't know if you've noticed something, but people have a hunger to know a certain word about an uncertain future. People are always looking for a little insight into what's going to happen in the days or months or years ahead. We want to know what's going to happen on the financial horizon so that we can start making plans now. We want to know what's predicted to happen politically in the next election. Or we want to know what's going to happen on the world stage of history, especially during these tumultuous, dangerous times in which we live. People just have a hunger for a certain word in an uncertain world. What's the future going to be? What's it going to hold? I don't know if you remember this, but in the 1990s, there was a uh, infomercial about the Psychic Friends Network. Anybody remember that, or am I just showing my age? You probably remember it if you were old enough because it was hosted by singer Dionne Warwick. And for only $3.99 a minute... You could call a certain number, and a psychic on the other end of the line would predict your future. They would speak into your future. At its height, the Psychic Friends Network brought in over $125 million every single year because people had a hunger for a certain word about their uncertain future. Of course, I think it was 1998 that... Dion and all the people that worked for the Psychic Friends Network were shocked when they filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy and eventually went out of business. And even back then, I was thinking, didn't they see that coming? (laughs) Didn't you see it coming? You're the Psychic Friends. You should have seen this coming. You should have already had your resume ready, girl. I don't have any sympathy for you whatsoever. And I think you understand that it was just simply a money-making ploy that was, that was working off of that innate desire and hunger for people for a certain word about an uncertain future. Now, the reason I tell you that this morning is because whenever we turn to the pages of Scripture, like we did last week, for example, one of the evidences for the reality that Christ Jesus is the Son of God who came into the world and lived a sinless life who offered his life on the cross of Calvary as a substitute for our sin, who died and rose from the dead on the third day, and who is now with God the Father in heaven and promised to come back one day. One of the evidences that he is who he says he is is that he fulfilled so many prophecies that were foretold about the coming Savior of the world. Last week, we looked at Psalm 22. Today, I want to take you to Isaiah 53, another prophecy that doesn't just foretell, but foretells what's going to happen when the Son of God, the Messiah, comes into the world. Isaiah, the prophet, is looking from his perspective forward towards the cross, and he shows us an explicit, excruciating detail what the Son of God would suffer on behalf of sinners. We, living in the 21st century, we look back to the cross of Calvary. But either way, the cross of Calvary becomes that central point of human history where our eternal destinies are decided. How we view and how we respond to the one hanging on the cross of Calvary is the answer to how we will spend eternity. Either separated from God because we've rejected his son and his sacrifice, or eternally with God in love and grace and forgiveness because we have embraced his son that he gave for us on the cross of Calvary. So in Isaiah chapter 53, we're going to discover that God sent his son 
to be our suffering substitute. And as Isaiah reveals this identity of this coming someone, this coming somebody, he gives us some insights. Think about, first of all, what I'm going to call the man of substitution. He begins by talking to us in Isaiah 53, verse 1, about the man of substitution. And Isaiah has, in the latter part of this previous chapter, chapter 52, has has prophesied that the Son of God will be successful and victorious. But now look at what he says in Isaiah 53, verse 1. He asked the question, who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed. Isaiah asked this rhetorical question. I've told you about this coming somebody who's going to be successful, and yet he's also going to have to suffer. Who has believed our report? And it's a rhetorical question anticipating a negative answer. The answer is no one's going to believe our report. No one's going to believe what God has said his son is going to do when he comes into the world. Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? That's an Old Testament phrase, the arm of the Lord, to speak of the strength and the power of God. Kind of like when you look at my arms, you think power. You know, and so, so, whenever, so whenever Isaiah says, to whom has the arm of the Lord, he's saying, to whom has the strength of God been revealed? Because it looks like weakness. A servant who's going to come and suffer? That That doesn't look like strength. That looks like weakness. A somebody who's going to come and be treated like a nobody, that doesn't look like strength. That looks like weakness. And Isaiah knows that there are going to be so many people, in spite of what God has said about his son coming, they will not believe. They won't even believe what they've heard. They won't even believe what they see. They won't believe the truth of the man of substitution. They won't believe him. By the way, in our day today, it astounds me of how we play so loosely with the truth. Truth is not based on an opinion poll. Truth is not determined by if the majority of people think something's true. True corresponds to reality. Young people, you need to know truth is not up for grabs. Truth is truth, whether you like it or not, whether you embrace it or not, whether it's popular or not, and especially when it comes to the truth about who Jesus is. There may be billions around the world who reject him and do not believe he was anything more than either an historical figure or a good teacher or perhaps even a miracle worker, but that's as far as they go. But the truth of the matter is he is the son of God sent from heaven to save sinners by dying our death. And Isaiah says, who's going to believe this report? To whom has the strength of God been revealed? And even though others don't believe it, It doesn't make it any less true. He goes on in verse 2 and he writes, For he, this is the suffering servant, this is the Son of God, this is the one Isaiah has already called in his book, Emmanuel, God with us. For he grew up before him, before God, like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground, And he had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. Now remember, Isaiah is a Jew. He's writing to the ancient Jewish people who were anticipating the coming Messiah who would be the rightful king of Israel, who would sit on the throne of David, the greatest king of Israel. And yet here Isaiah tells us that even though we expect this magnificent, majestic, powerful, political, military warrior figure to be our Messiah, that's not going to really be the identity of the Messiah. The coming one is going to grow up before God like a young plant. On the side of my yard, we cut down a, a tree, and I've noticed that there are young shoots that are growing up out of that root They're fragile, they're negligible, they're tender, they're easily broken, they're easily overlooked. And that is what we see in Jesus, born of a virgin to Mary and Joseph from Nazareth, a nobody 
married to another nobody as far as the world was concerned, living in a nowhere town, Nazareth, going nowhere. That's not where the Messiah, the Savior of the world, should be born. He should be born in Rome, in Caesar's palace. He should be born in the home of the high priest in the temple of Israel in Jerusalem. But no, no, our Savior was born of a virgin in an obscure little town. He grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. There's nothing that would nurture him and strengthen him and sustain him. It looks like his life could be extinguished at any moment. Certainly true. Herod tried to kill him when he was born, had to flee to Egypt for his life. His parents had to take him to spare him. And even growing up, he just grew up like us, became a human being, an unpromising beginning, an unimpressive appearance. In fact, Isaiah says he had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. Contrary to a lot of the artwork from the Middle Ages, little infant Jesus or little toddler Jesus or little boy Jesus didn't walk around with a halo over his head or a shining light from heaven that followed him at every move he made. No, when you looked at him, No outward appearance said, here is the king of all kings. Here is the Lord of all the lords of the world. Here's the one. One day every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. But even though he didn't look like what people expected out of their political leader, he was exactly the one God sent. He is the exact one that we need. And how do we treat this one that God sends into the world? Verse 3 He was despised and rejected by men. That's how we treated him. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised. And we esteemed him not. There he is. Despised and rejected. In his own day, as he began his public ministry, People looked at him and sneered at him. Isn't that Jesus of Nazareth? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Who does he think he is? He's a nobody from nowhere going nowhere. People despised him and rejected him. The religious establishment of his day rejected him and despised him. But even as he hung on the cross of Calvary, it says those who passed by wagged their their tongues at him and they ridiculed him and they mocked him and they laughed at him. Here's the king of the Jews. He has some king, all right. Let God save him if God wants him. Come down from that cross and then I'll worship you, king of the Jews despised and rejected by men. And Isaiah says he will be a man of sorrows. That word literally means griefs. He'll be a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. All the pain that our sin brought into the world, he will feel. Not only physically, but also morally and spiritually. All the pain of that sin he felt and he bore it on his own body, on the cross. As a matter of fact, when it says, it says, and as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. It says, rather than look at him, we turned away from him and we esteemed him. Isaiah is using a legal term. It's an accounting term. It's to reckon up finances. And he says, men looked at Jesus and they calculated and determined He's not worth anything. It's not worth anything to me. Esteemed him not. Don't need him. No value. By the way, it's sad that there are people who still treat Jesus just that way. Don't need him. Adds nothing of value to me. There's a, there's a disease called prosopagnosia. Prosopagnosia is more commonly called face blindness. Most people who suffer from this Ill, illness uh, have it from birth, and most people have it all their lives. It's a face blindness. It means that people they know, they don't recognize their faces each time they see them. It could be your mother, and you don't recognize her 
each new time you see her. It could be your spouse. It could be your own child. It could be a coworker, a friend. That every time you see them for the first time, you can't remember their face. Most people learn coping skills when they have face blindness. They, they'll memorize, if they can't memorize the face, they memorize how they walk. And they become very good at watching people. Or, or they remember the sound of their voice, but they can't recognize their face, even though they ought to. And the greatest sin of Israel was when God sent his son, the very one that the prophets had told would come, the very people who should have known him and recognized him, rejected him, and didn't want him, and didn't see him for who he was because he didn't meet their expectations. And the same is true in our day. There are people who will tip their hat to Jesus. Oh, he was a good teacher. Oh, he was a great friend to sinners. Oh, I've heard he did some miracles. Maybe it wasn't really a miracle, but he went about doing some good things. Dear friend, I like what C.S. Lewis said. Jesus was either liar, a lunatic, or he's Lord. But he can't just be a good man. He's a liar because he's the one who said he is the son of God and that he alone has the power to forgive sins and that he would die, be buried, but rise from the dead on the third day victorious over the grave. If you think that, and if you think the whole world's eternal destiny rests on your shoulders, and yet that's not true, you're a lunatic. We've got help for you. Or you're a liar. You know all of that is not true. You know that you're not the savior of the world. You know that I am not the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, and you know it. it's not true, but you say it anyway, then you're a liar. There's only a third option left. If you're not a lunatic and if you're not a liar, you're the Lord. And that is who he is. And even though people despised and rejected him, even though he suffered for us, and even though people hid their faces and turned away from him and esteemed him not, it doesn't change the fact he is the son of God. Maybe you'll say, man, if I were back then, I would have seen him and I would have known who he was and I would have worshiped him. No, you wouldn't have. In fact, it's easier for us to believe in Jesus today than it was for them. Listen, friend, we've got 2,000 years of completed church history. We've got the historical records of his earthly life and ministry and miracles we call the Gospels of the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. We've got the eyewitness testimony of those who lived there and saw him die, but also three days later saw him alive, victorious over the grave, and who went to their deaths as martyrs. We've got the testimony of martyrs and the church fathers, and we've got the written word of God bound in leather or on your phone, where we can go back and look at the Old Testament and see it fulfilled in the New Testament. It's easier for you to believe, and yet there are still people who won't. Because they don't want the real Jesus. They only want the one who's a self-help guru or who's nice and never confronts anybody about their sin or who doesn't ask you to believe in him exclusively. No, they don't want him. But it doesn't change the fact he is the man of substitution. But he's also, I want you to notice, Isaiah talks to us about the method of substitution. If he's our substitute, what did he do? How did he do it? Isaiah 53 verse 4 the method. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. Do you hear that? Isaiah says, surely, truly, he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. All the pain that our sin brought into our lives and brought into the world, he has borne it on his own body. He has carried it away. Now, we're not Jews in the first century or even seven centuries before the first century. We're, we're New Testament Christians, so maybe we run right past this. But Isaiah's audience immediately knew Isaiah's referring to the Day of Atonement. He's referring back to the sacrifices of Israel you remember every year on the Day of Atonement, they would take two lambs. One, they would sacrifice and shed its blood as a substitute for the people because sin must be judged. 
In another one, the priest, the high priest, would lay his hands on the head of that lamb or that goat, and then he would infer and impute all the sins of the people on that scapegoat. And then that scapegoat would be led out into the wilderness, bearing the sin of the people for that year, carrying their sins away so they won't be confronted with it. And Isaiah saying, that's all pointing to the one who's going to come and do it, not ceremonially or symbolically, but do it in reality. He's going to take our sin and he's going to bear the brunt of judgment for our sin and he's going to carry it away where we don't have to face our sin because we can be forgiven if we'll trust in him. And yet, how did we respond to this great gift of grace? It says, we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. We once again judged that when he's dying on the cross of Calvary, he's getting what he deserved. He must have done something wrong. That's what people said. They're saying he's dying for his own sin. In ancient Israel, it was a very common assumption that if a person was suffering, they must have done something to get God's judgment like that. We still hear that today. Oh, a hurricane hit New Orleans. Oh, those terrible sinners in New Orleans. I saw that coming. As if you're not a sinner. And it's one thing for me to judge another sinner or for another sinner to judge me. But to look at Jesus dying on the cross of Calvary and to still say he must be a sinner when even Pilate had to say, I can find no fault in this man. No deceit or guile was ever found in our Savior. He truly was the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. There's a half truth here in verse 4. He was stricken and smitten by God and afflicted by God. That's true. But it wasn't for his sin. And that leads us to the third observation I want to make. Not only the man and the method of substitution, but the meaning of substitution. Listen to Isaiah chapter 53, verse 5, and you'll see why Jesus hung on the cross of Calvary. Isaiah writes, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement, literally the beating that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. Don't you understand? Yes, he was stricken and smitten and afflicted by God. But it wasn't because of his sin. He had none. It was for our sin. It was for our transgressions. It was for our iniquities. It was for our wrong that we had done. He was dying as a substitute for sinners. Punishment for him, peace for me and you. Wounds for him, healing for me and for you. Chastisement and beating for him, blessings of God for me and for you. Verse 5, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Listen, you may not believe the Bible, but you can't argue with the first part of verse or verse 6 all we like sheep have gone astray we have turned everyone to his own way you know it in your heart that there's a standard of right and wrong and none of us have ever perfectly lived up to it we don't even live up to our own standards of right and wrong I'm going to do better today I'm not going to lose my temper I'm not going to use that language I'm going to work hard not procrastinate I'm not going to give in to that addiction again and we break our own standards of right and wrong over and over and over you know why? because we're just like sheep we've all gone astray we've all wandered off the path of what is right we've each turned our own way rather than God's way and we find ourselves in a mess called sin under the judgment of God as a result of it. Have you ever heard those news stories about a family pet that was taken on vacation with the family and then somehow they lose uh, Scruffy you know, during vacation and they look for Scruffy, they can't find Scruffy and they finally have to leave and go back home a few days later and they live a thousand miles away from where they vacationed 
And then a year later, in Boca Raton, Florida, Scruffy shows up at the family door and the news people go crazy. Oh my goodness, this dog was lost but found its way home. We'll make movies about dogs that find their way home. You've never heard that story about a sheep. You know why? Because sheep are prone to get lost, but sheep are not the smartest animals in the barnyard. Sheep can be dumb. They can be directionless. Sheep are defenseless. They often get lost, and if they're not found by the shepherd, they will die in the wilderness, either of exposure or be devoured by predators. Somebody's got to go find them and bring them home. And if salvation is depending on me to clean up my life and to do better, I am doomed to hell. I cannot do it. I need a shepherd who will come hunt me down find me, rescue me, and say, you're safe now with me. And his name is Jesus. He is the Lord who is my shepherd of the 23rd Psalm. He is the good shepherd of John 10 who doesn't make his sheep die for him. He dies for his sheep. He is the great shepherd of our souls, and he's the chief shepherd that's going to come back one day. And the Bible says, as your pastor, I'm going to stand before him and give an account of how I have been the under-shepherd of this church. I need him, and I'm grateful that he, he is the one who saves us. And how does he save us? How does he save those of us who have strayed, all of us? says, the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. The judgment for our sin was laid on Jesus on the cross of Calvary, which is why Jesus was abandoned. Psalm 22, 1, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's because in that moment, Jesus became our suffering substitute. God sent his son to be the substitutionary sacrifice for sinners, for us. You know, there's a book called Five Love Languages. Anybody ever read that? Gary Smalley, Five Love Languages. Talk about the different ways we express love. We all have a kind of a primary way we express love. You know, what are they? Uh, they're they're um, gifts. Uh, so that's one way people express their love. Time is one way people express their love. Uh, words of affection, that's the way some people show their love. Uh, physical touch is another way. And then the fifth way that people often express their love, acts of service. And sometimes you marry a person who has a different love language than you or you're dating a person who has a different love language than you, or your mom or your dad or your kids, you have different love languages, and and you may not feel loved. I know I I have a particular love language, and it's different than my wife's. My wife's love language is acts of service. And if I ever was brave enough on a day that I wasn't feeling loved, say, I just don't know if you love me. I bet what she would say is, excuse me, (laughs) you you what? (laughs) You're questioning my love after everything I do for you and after everything I do for this family and after how I am serving everyone first ahead of myself. If that's not love, what is that? And maybe this morning for someone in this room, after the struggles you've had this past week or the past, you're feeling Does God love me? Could he love me? Could he love somebody like me? The greatest act of service ever done for anyone was done by the Son of God for you. When he willingly went to the cross of Calvary, voluntarily taking your sin upon his own body on the cross, saying, I love you this much. Never doubt the love of God. God has demonstrated his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Romans chapter five, verse eight. Jesus said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God loves you. That's not the question. The question today is, will you receive God's love by putting your trust in Jesus Christ, your substitutionary sacrifice for sin. I'm going to lead us in a prayer. Maybe today for the first time in your life, you want to receive Christ as your savior. 
I hope you'll do that today. I'm also going to give us all some homework to do. You noticed I didn't read the whole chapter. There's, a, there's another service I got to get to. And uh, they don't like it when I make them wait in the parking lot. We could spend the next month trying to read and understand Isaiah 53. There's so much there. But can I tell you something? Not only did Isaiah predict the suffering of our Savior, Isaiah also predicted in detail the death of our Savior, the burial of our Savior. Rather than being among criminals, he was crucified with criminals, but he was buried in a rich man's grave, Joseph of Arimathea. And 700 years before it happened, Isaiah prophesied that not only would he be buried, but that he would see the victory of what he did on the cross, and he would see many come to faith in God through what he did. Isaiah prophesied the resurrection of Jesus. Isaiah prophesied the return of Jesus to glory. It's all in one chapter, Isaiah 53. So I'm going to encourage you this week, meditate on Isaiah 53. Read the whole chapter. Read it tomorrow in the English Standard Version. Read it the next day in the New King James Version. Or read it the third day in the New International Version. I promise you, the more you meditate on Isaiah 53, the more you will see how much God loves you. And it will prepare your heart for Easter. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you that you sent Jesus Christ, your son, to be the substitutionary sacrifice for us. We are the sinners. We are the sheep who have gone astray. We are the ones who have rebelled against you. And yet, out of your love for us, you sent Jesus to willingly take our punishment on the cross of Calvary. And as God in flesh, he paid the price that his own law demanded. And having conquered death, he rose from the dead. And he's alive today. And we can call out to him and you tell us and promise in the scriptures that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So Father, I pray that right now a dad will call out on the name of the Lord. I want to be saved, Lord. A mom or a grandparent or a young person today will call out on the name of the Lord Jesus. I want to be saved. I trust in you and you alone who took my place on the cross, who rose from the dead, who's alive today. I trust you as the Son of God, my Savior. Father, I praise you for your promise and your word that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. May they not be ashamed of what they've just done, but may they let someone know today I've trusted Christ as Savior. Maybe they'll let me or Matt know at our next step area or here at the front, or maybe they will use a Let's Connect card and check that box that says, today I'm committing my life to Christ. Maybe they'll tell the person that they're here with today in church or they're watching online, today I'm committing my life to Jesus. He died for me, I'm gonna commit my life to him and receive his eternal life, his forgiveness, his love. Father, we love you because you first loved us. In Christ's name we pray, amen. I love you guys. God bless you and I hope you have a blessed morning. Tell someone around you as you make your way out that it was good to see them today. Amen.